Hi everyone, I'm Ron Kalyan. I'm on the Microsoft 365 product marketing team. And I'm Talal Mir. I'm a principal program manager on the security compliance team. And this is an episode three with Dan Costa talking about how do you bring in HR, legal, privacy, and compliance into building an effective insider risk management program. Yeah, super important. This is not like security where you can just take care of this in your SOC alone. You need collaboration. And he's going to tell us more on why that's critical. Yeah, it was awesome talking to Dan last week. So I'm let's do it. So when you talk about these predispositions, these stressors, you know, you gave a great example of a organizational stressor, stressor like somebody being demoted or somebody being put on a performance improvement plan. Um, you can also have personal stressors outside of work that you guys have talked about openly in, in a lot of your guidance and whatnot. Mm-hmm. When you look at these, at least the organizational stressors, they, a lot of times they reside with your human resources department. Right? So this is a place where you have to kind of negotiate with them to be able to bring this data in. So talk to me about that. How do you guide um, the teams that are looking to establish these connections with their human resources department, the HR department, to negotiate this kind of data so that it's not just for, you know, it's for, a, it's for insider risk management purposes. So talk about that and also talk about are there opportunities that you see where you can potentially infer sentiment by looking at, let's say, communication patterns or, um, you know, physical movement patterns or digital login patterns and things like that. So how how can you help to identify these early indicators, if you will? Yeah. So let's let's start with kind of the how we bridge the gap between the insider threat program and and stakeholders like human resources, Um, because uh, Talal, you're spot on. They're they're one of the key stakeholders for an insider threat program really in in two respects. One is they own a lot of the data that will allow us to gather the context that we can use to augment or supplement what we're seeing from our technical detection capabilities to figure out was that activity appropriate for the job role, the responsibility of the individual associated with the activity. How can we how can we pull left kind of uh, relative to an, an incident progression and find folks that might be experiencing kind of these these organizational stressors, right? That's the that's data that our, our human resources stakeholders have and hold. And we've seen or insider threat programs over the years struggle with kind of building the relationships between um, program stakeholders like human resource management. And, and a lot of the challenges there from, from what we've seen, come down to kind of a, a, a lack of understanding of what it is that the insider threat program is actually trying to do. And in many cases, this has been kind of a, a, um, a, a the insider threat program isn't necessarily um, without fault in, in making that impression um, stick in the minds of, of human resources. So this, this goes back to the insider threat programs not trying to be duplicative or, or boil the ocean or kind of carve off too big of a, a part of this, this broader enterprise-wide activity that needs to happen to manage insider risk. And, and in that early relationship building and establishment, there's, there's an education piece that has to happen. Human resources folks aren't spending all day every day thinking about how insiders can misuse their access like, like we are, right? So, so much of it is kind of these are the threats that our critical assets po- or, or, um, are, are subject to by the nature of our employees having authorized access to them. We understand that this isn't always the most comfortable subject to talk about, but here are here is a myriad of incident data that shows where vulnerabilities existed within a human resource process or a lack of information sharing between HR and IT enabled an insider to carry out their attack or to evade detection for some significant amount of time. So, so much of it just starts with, with education. Once we've got them just aware of the fact that this is something that the organization you know, has to consider as a part of kind of its overarching security strategy, we need to help them understand kind of the role, the, the critical role that they play, understanding the, how we use contextual information, understanding how we don't use contextual information, and helping them understand what, what, with really what an insider threat program is designed to do is help them make better data-driven decisions faster by giving them access to analysis that can only be conducted by folks that can take the data that they have and stitch it together with IT, 
data, with SOC data, with information assurance data, with the risk register that's owned by our chief risk officer, they probably don't want to be spending all of their times uh, writing analytics uh, that and, and making the relationships uh, with IT and legal to, to facilitate some of that stuff. That's what the Insider Threat Program is here for. So helping them understand that this is a mutually beneficial relationship, that the data that they provide will help the organization more proactively manage insider risk, and that they are a stakeholder in terms of they are they are potentially recipients of the results of the analysis that the Insider Threat Program itself will conduct, helping them better understand kind of how, how to do things like make refinements, enhancements, or improvements to the onboarding and offboarding processes, helping them understand when it might be time to make a change to employee compensation strategies within the organization, how the employee performance management system is, is leveraged within the organization. The Insider Threat Program, once it's up and running and kind of bringing in all the different data and engaging with all the different stakeholders, can, can help highlight and emphasize kind of where those processes are working, where they can be refined. And it's hard for the, it's hard for the stakeholders to kind of do that work on their own. So there's a fine line to walk there too, right? Which is you can't go in and say, we think we can be doing your job better than you can because we have data scientists and all this other cool data. So um, a lot of effective insider threat program building from a relationship building uh, pers uh, perspective really comes down to having an insider threat program manager who has kind of that, that organizational savvy that can find kind of the right ways to build and establish these relationships within their organizations. Yeah. So it's not, not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, we're seeing lots of organizations be successful at um, helping their, their stakeholders understand the threat, helping their stakeholders understand the, the two-way street of this is the information we need, here's why we need it from you, here's why you're the only part of the organization that can help us with this, and here's how we think it can be beneficial to you and the organization more broadly. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think this is a kind of conversation that, you know, Talai and I had when we first got into this space together. He'd already been in it, but I had kind of come come at it from a product perspective as we think about, you know, helping our customers, uh, you know, tackle tackle these, these issues. Um, and one of the things we talked about early on was, hey, look, this is a, like you mentioned, Dan, this is a, this is a human problem. This is the employees that you're dealing with. These are people that are part of your organizational family, right? You just can't, you know, set something up that starts investigating people, you know, and, and snooping on them and doing that sort of thing. You got to take a little more holistic sort of viewpoint here. And the things that Tala and I talked about were around, you know, insider and this is why insider risks makes more sense than insider threat because you know as you think about hr they're stewards of the corporate culture right they're the ones that are responsible for help building a corporate culture of inclusion of you know people feeling like they are they are you know wanted and they are rewarded and they're building towards a positive you know outcome for the organization and so for them you know, the program itself can highlight, to your point, the risks that are there that might impact that organizational health and in a way actually help support a better, stronger organization by pointing out areas that, that you know, are, are vulnerable vulnerabilities that they can go after and build training around that they can build that, you know, go out and say, hey, this is something we should be doing or people aren't feeling you know, uh, supported. And so they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. You know, is, is rather than treating the symptom, treat the underlying issue. That That's a great point, Raman. So um, I, I would kind of add to that and, and, you know, take that a step further, which is I, I think stakeholder parts of the organization like human resources don't intuitively or necessarily think about the things that they do as being influencers of a of increased security or resilience within the organization. So so much of that education is helping them understand, look, 
Um, organizations that have better management practices, have higher degrees of employee engagement, have higher degrees of perceived organizational support. Uh, amongst all the other great benefits that they experience, they also experience less security incidents. So what you're doing in, in these practices are, are, are security controls. And, and we really have to start to help our organizations broaden their, their understanding of what constitutes a security control. And, and oh, by the way, HR, if, if you know that these are things that you'd like to be doing just to increase morale, we can amplify that ask and message up the chain when it comes time for budget requests by saying, hey, not only is this a good thing to, for us to do from a talent management perspective, but it's also going to, it's, it's a key security strategy for our organization. Another way for kind of those two, those two disparate parts of the organization to kind of work together in some mutually beneficial way. You know, a couple of years ago, we did a study called the critical role of positive incentives uh, in, in mitigating uh, insider threats. And it, it was really looking at just this, Raman, which is, could we establish a relationship between kind of levels of connectedness at work, employee engagement, perceived organizational support, and a reduction in the number of insider incidents that organizations experience? We actually leveraged our open source insider threat information sharing group uh, for a lot of that work to conduct surveys. And what we saw was positive correlation between kind of increases across those, those dimensions of kind of connectedness at work, perceived organizational support, and a decrease in the number of insider incidents that organizations were experiencing. So the, the key takeaway from that study was better places to work end up also being more secure organizations, particularly as it pertains to uh, insider risk. Now we were trying to kind of continue that work and drive that towards kind of a, a causal model and, a, and really being able to show that these are the root causes, these, these management practices, these HR practices, by putting them in place, you, you, you cause a reduction in insider incidents. Um, so it's, it's an area of ongoing research, but intuitively it just makes sense, right? And, and so much of what, what we're trying to do kind of in, in 2020 with insider threat programs is help folks recharacterize what constitutes security controls and what constitute valid response options for the, the things that insider threat programs should be on the lookout for. Okay, so on that, I assume there's an uh, inverse correlation then between uh, an organization being potentially disconnected because of things like work from home and what's happening in today's environment and an increase in potentially insider risk uh, activity. Is that a fair uh, extrapolation to make? Well, I, I think it's a, a fair hypothesis to consider testing, right? Um, you know, it's it's kind of the, the opposite side of the coin. And I, I think now would be kind of a, a fantastic time to be making sure that we can collect evidence and data that would show kind of those, those data points trending in maybe a, a different direction, right? Um, as as our organizations are experiencing kind of unprecedented volumes of personal and professional stressors across our workforces, what's that doing to kind of the, the rates of occurrence or the rates of frequency with which we're experiencing kind of insider misuse cases? Um, and, and, you know, it's the kind of thing where where it takes organizations a while to collect that data, right? So I don't know that we're going to know for sure um, until we're maybe a little bit further out because the, these incidents tend to not evolve over the course of kind of days and weeks or even months, but usually on the order of magnitude of several months, if not if not years in most cases. So, you know, I, it's one of those things where I, I think there are going to be far reaching implications, particularly from an insider threat perspective um, that we that we'll be able to attribute to kind of just how drastically kind of everyone's normal change over the past several months. So then um, we talked about stressors, you know, a lot of times we hear customers talk about, um, you know, insider risk management really boils down to a game of indicators. Mm -hmm. We have the right set of indicators and the ability to kind of orchestrate over that, correlate over that, that's when you start to at least do the first part of the whole um, problem, which is to identify them. Mm -hmm. One of those indicators you talked about are these stressors, um, and you talked about the importance of partnering with uh, your human resource resources organization. But how do you think about the potential to kind of infer those stressors uh, through communication channels 
or other means of looking at certain indicators in an environment to see if somebody is potentially disgruntled. Uh, would love to get your thoughts on that based on what you've researched. Yeah, certainly. So, so leveraging kind of text analytics and natural understanding uh, has been kind of a, a hallmark of some of the some of the the, the research that we've done in this space. Uh, we've got a, a multi-part blog series that talks about how to apply text analytics to various stages of kind of insider threat detection, uh, and and what you'll find in there is kind of a, a, a real strong kind of emphasis and focus on. Uh, the detection of the concerning behaviors and activities, and the stressors that that kind of precede attacks. So, um, the state of the practice, kind of a few years ago, was base, was was keyword based searches, right? So these big buckets of words that uh, we associate with topics like money or topics like um, topics like code name sensitive projects within organizations. And every time we see one of those words being used, let's uh, generate an alert and have an analyst kind of dig in, dig in there. Uh, over the past several years, we've seen kind of the, the state of the practice move past those simple keyword based searches and start to leverage AI and ML to help with natural language understanding that can kind of better contextualize that uh, deal with the nuances of electronic communication, and then again form the foundation for kind of uh, features that that comprise kind of a broader model that that's really a, a model of models that helps us understand kind of uh, the the data that we're seeing in aggregate across our organizations relative to what we constitute as kind of our our highest priority risks to our critical assets. So. It's and this goes back to our, our HR friends and our, also our friends in legal and privacy. When th this can be a tough pill to swallow from a legal privacy and civil liberties protection perspective for lots of organizations, right? This is like the next step. We're going to start reading our our employees' electronic communications to figure out if they're talking about having money problems, and this goes back to the need to educate those stakeholders uh, in in terms of what it is that we're actually trying to do. What we're not trying to do, who gets access to that analysis, and what the allowable response options are with, with regards to kind of the end products or end results of that analysis, and, and helping them understand that, no, no, we want to we want to feed this back to you all so that we can help you all and support you all in your decision making processes about what it is that that we are seeing kind of on our organizations, networks, and systems. So it it's it's something that we're seeing lots of organizations start to incorporate after close consultation and collaboration with their legal privacy and civil liberties folks. And, and certainly as you're, you're considering this for, for large organizations that are operating maybe outside of the United States, you're going to make, you're going to have to make sure that you're, you're working within all of those different kind of legal jurisdictions that your program might be operating to understand kind of what is and is not allowable. Um, in those different jurisdictions, because kind of the privacy protection rules obviously change depending on kind of operating location. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I had a conversation with a customer, I think, back in uh, springtime, and and the the CISO was all in on on hey, I want to go and identify these risks using automated tools, et cetera. Um, and and about a week later, I get another phone call, which is hey, now my chief privacy officer wants to have a conversation with you. And she needs to better understand how, you know, information is being protected, how the PII of individuals is being protected. Because if you like, like to your point, I could I could generate an alert, but that doesn't mean that person is necessarily doing something wrong. It's just an alert that's popping up. Now, at that point, I want to protect their information. I want to make it private, anonymized so that. There isn't this bias, this discrimination that might happen at the, you know, at the analyst level. And, and so once we went through all of the different, you know, ways to protect information and the privacy anonymization pieces, you know, that convinced them and, and, and they said, all right, great, we're going to roll this out um, worldwide across multiple divisions in multiple um, countries. So you bring about, you know, that's a great point there. The other point you made, Dan, was around like, um, you know, there's multiple sources here, and, and I think Talat touched upon this earlier, which is customers struggle to figure out how do I get started, right? Um, you talked about, hey, you need sentiment analysis, you need contextual information, you need data sources beyond just 
Like, for example, a lot of organizations say that they have an insider risk program, but yet they've just implemented DLP. And that's mm -hmm. it. It's like, well, that's only one piece of the puzzle. And that's right. going to generate alert fatigue for you. Yeah. But when, we, when we talk to them, we say, hey, you need, you need not only the endpoint you know, indicators, but you need signals from sentiment. You need signals from you know, maybe HR data and other sources. I'm like, wow, that's a lot for me to try to figure out and control. Right. You know what I mean? So I think getting started quickly and to your point around scoping it to what are the risks that are most most important, and then and then, you know, quickly getting started on tackling those, scoping the right people, and involving the cross organizational parties, is, is probably you know is the foundational step that most organizations take. Yeah, that that kind of we have a DLP program or we're trying to expand it. You know, that's a very common pattern that we've seen in industry. And one of the places that we we've um, helped organizations kind of get started in that space. What's that next data source to incorporate uh, was was simply a list of known departing employees um, provided to us by human resources. So just knowing kind of who is departing from the organization at any given time gives us the opportunity to kind of supplement or augment what we have in the data loss prevention tools so that if we see kind of alerts or hits associated with folks that have announced their resignation, uh, we've found that most theft of intellectual property cases um, that, that we've studied tend to occur kind of within a 30 to 90 day window uh, of an, in an individual announcing their departure from the organization. So one of the earliest ways to address alert fatigue from something like a DLP is to just grab that tiny piece of context owned by human resources, right? And it's, it's focused, it's specific. We can point to data that kind of just provides a rationale or a justification as to why we, why we think we need access to this information, how we'll use it, how we'll protect it. It gives us an opportunity to, to start small, but still make a big impact and show, look, HR, because we were able to incorporate this information, we reduced our kind of false positives rate by X or Y percentage. And we were able to increase kind of our ability to recover intellectual property, you know, as it was being uh, targeted for exfiltration by our departing employees. So it's, it's, it's finding those use cases that are important to our organizations that you, can, that you can back up with empirical data and, and starting small and taking those quick wins, high impact solutions and finding ways to kind of build on those successes to establish broader relationships. Yeah, another thing that uh, um, I remember a customer brought this up, customer of mine brought this up when we had a conversation with them. Um, they said that, look, the, you know, DLP is just one piece. Another way to think about that is because DLP is really about data loss. And if you just focus in on that, as far as your insider risk program is concerned, you're automatically sort of, you know, focusing just on the confidentiality type risks. What about fraud? What about sabotage? What about physical issues that you might come across, right? So it, you have to kind of take that holistic approach and then from there start to prioritize and figure out what you want to try to target. Well, yeah, and also, I was so, going to say like also the other parts of it, which around, like you mentioned this, the, the, you know, workplace harassment, right? You, you have other risks that are, that are more sort of, you know, human oriented um, that, that DLP can't necessarily, you know, identify. And the one thing that you just talked about just now, which is like, you know, what happened 60, 90, 180 days prior, that's not gonna be, get picked up by a, uh, by a transactional tool that just looks at today's data. You need that historical data to go back and reason over, right? Yeah, I mean, so much, uh, so much about what we're doing with insider threat detection is about kind of an anomaly detection, right? An understanding of kind of a deviation from a defined process or the ways that things kind of normally happen as it pertains to kind of authorized use of our organization's critical assets. So Raman, you're spot on. If we're trying to determine deviations from normal, we, we need to have the capability to uh, uh, have an understanding of what normal has looked like historically, right? So if it's finding kind of how long back is long enough to look to establish a pattern of normal. But, but as we've seen over the past couple of months, it's also having an understanding of knowing when 
when normal is going to change and, and knowing how quickly it's going to take for us to establish kind of what a what a new normal looks like. And that's something that we saw a countless number of insider threat programs struggle struggle with over the past few months, which is every baseline that they were relying on as the foundation for an anomaly detection strategy was completely turned upside down and onto its head and rendered almost ineffective or useless when everybody fundamentally changed their normal in the way that they they normally conduct authorized access to their organization's critical assets. So the the last several months have kind of really shown a light on the fact that we've we've got to get better at at being able to find ways to articulate and describe what normal or expected is that might not necessarily have to rely on six months or a year's worth of data. And, and, And where do we start there? With policies and procedures. How do we make it easier for our technical detection strategies to mirror our policies and procedures? When everybody changed their policies and procedures, as it pertained to remote work and, and authorized use of information technology systems, we saw insider threat programs really struggle to catch up to those, those changes and to make sure their detection strategies and their prevention strategies caught up. So there's, there's lots of lessons learned over the past few months about you know, h- how we do that and, how, and, and where our opportunities for improvement are as a community. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry, Doug, go ahead, man. No, I was just saying awesome. That's it. Sorry, that's a stupid line. <laughs> <threw it there. laughs> so kind of one thing I wanted to just you know t- touch on there, Dan, is you, you're spot on, dude. On in terms of the 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 changes, the rapid change that that COVID has brought along. I mean, in fact, we did a survey here at Microsoft with uh, you know well over 200 CISOs. Um, uh, focused on insider risk, and one of the things that we found was, you know, 73% of them uh, said to us that they're they're planning on spending, you know, more on insider risk uh, technology uh, now with COVID than they were before. And I think this highlights the point that you just made, which is, you know, the systems and processes, if you even had them, you know, that we were using nine months ago, you know, aren't necessarily relevant today, right? You need things that can uh, get people are accessing data from endpoints that don't have agents on them, right? You you have people that are, you know, um, working in new ways, sharing things with others and new mechanisms, right? I mean, just look at this, this particular, you know, podcast, video cast, we're doing it from our houses, right? We've right. got, uh, we're, I've got a courier coming to pick up a, a, a scan, a sand disc, uh, you know, card here. And so, you know, it's one of those things where it's challenging for, for organizations uh, in this new world, right? Yeah, certainly. So it's, it's you know, now that we've got, now that we've got kind of the, the spotlight on the insider threat problem, uh, particularly with, with everything that's going on in the world, that, that highlights the need for organizations to be intentional about where they, where they put that expenditure Right. And this goes back to kind of where we started this discussion. You've got to think through now that now that, you know, you've got uh, evidence that suggests that maybe you've got some gap areas from an insider threat detection or prevention mechanism. How are you going to prioritize where your next security dollar goes for insider threats? And to get that answer right, you've got to take a, a risk management based approach to this. You've got to have an understanding of kind of what's currently in place. And you've got to also be a little bit future uh, forward thinking here in terms of how, how, when will things go back to the way that they were or something, something somewhat resembling the way that they were. Um, what lessons learned are we going to incorporate from the last several months into, in, into, into that new normal? So there's, it's, I'm, I'm, Happy to hear that 73% of CISOs intend to spend more for insider threats, but also kind of t- terrified for them because I want to make sure that they they understand what they're what they're actually trying to do with that security investment, and, and making sure that it's aligned with kind of the actual risks to their organizations, um, and being done in a way that is um, that is cognizant of their actual risk and what their current capabilities are and how that risk may, landscape might change and shift even within the next even within the next calendar year so it's 
it's it's a hard problem to juggle and it's it's a it's a continuously evolving process and a continuously evolving problem for organizations well hey dan thank you so much this was an awesome conversation today uh you brought a lot of insights um how can people get more information about some of the research that you you all are doing over there yes yeah, certainly so thank you both raman and tala this has been fantastic uh, for more information, uh, check out our website, cert.org slash insider dash threat. Uh, you can also contact us at insider dash threat dash feedback at cert.org. Uh, we've, um, um, in anticipation of nas National Insider Threat Awareness Month in September, uh, we're going to be out and about a lot trying to transition our research into as many broad communities of practice as we can. Uh, we'll be blogging to our Insider Threat blog uh, about once a week uh, in September. Uh, and uh, stay tuned for the, the seventh edition to the Common Sense Guide to Mitigating Insider Threats, which we're targeting for uh, a late, uh, late 2020 release. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both, guys. Appreciate it. Talaa, man, that was awesome speaking with Dan. I mean, it's clear that in order to have an effective program, you need to have HR legal involved in an integrated solution. That's right. It's got to be integrated and it's got to be collaborative. So that's what we provide. That's what we learned from Dan Costa and all the customers that he worked with. Uh, super valuable information. All right. Thanks for listening. Definitely be sure to subscribe because next time we're going to be speaking with Don Capelli, who's the CISO at Rockwell Automation. And we're looking forward to that conversation, right, Talat? Very much so, man. Very much so.